Unlike most episodes we've covered thus far, the opening sequence of episode 14 doesn't function as recap or to reframe what we already know. Rather, it is a direct follow-up to the ending sequence of the previous episode where we see the continued conversation between Irvin, Aaron, and Levi. Functionally, it just sets up the preceding arc with it literally being cut off right after Levi says that Aaron is accepted into the scouts. Pretty clearly saying, hey, Aaron's a scout now, so let us see what that means. Which also neatly brings us on to the second OP of the series, the name of which I will not try to pronounce. But to almost complete the scene we just talked about, the very first thing we see is the AOT signature birds flying over the wall and seeing the expansive world that lies beyond. And even more importantly, literally flashing an image of Annie's Titan immediately confirming that this is what we'll be setting our targets on next. Unlike the first OP, which was all about the struggles of humanity and the hunted becoming the hunters, this one is immediately evoking a marching theme or even a national anthem. Both the overall tone of the music as well as the lyrics all stress the importance of honor, patriotism, and strength, much more so than the survival we saw in the first opening. I think lines like, We grip two steel blades of gloria, sing the songs of victory, and have the wings of freedom on our back, illustrate that national anthem type vibe very well. Similarly, this opening also features a lot of imagery where it is the soldiers drawing blood instead of being hunted by the titans. Once again showing that, with Aaron on their side, the odds are now tipped in their favor. And this might be me to truly overanalyzing, but I also find the bird imagery we get here quite curious. Like I already mentioned, obviously birds appear a lot in the series. Everything from the song literally titled Birds in a Cage, to the birds that we see all representing freedom and everything in between. But the thing is, if memory serves me right, it is always either a black or white bird, never both in the same scene. In this opening, however, we start with the white birds flying across the wall, but end with the wings of freedom sprawling into both black and white birds. Before you get out your tinfoil, clearly the obvious answer here is purely contrast, right? The wings of freedom have two colors, so we need differently colored birds. So them being black and white, literally the polar opposites, just makes sense from an artistic point of view. And if I had to bet my money on it, I'd say it is about 95% just that. Especially in an opening that is meant to hype you up rather than convey some extremely intricate story. But then again, this is Attack on Titan we're talking about, right? And birds are just about the most important symbol in the series. So could this be some sort of representation of the diverging paths Aaron could have walked? Could it be a message of unity between Marley and Paradis? As in, the black birds showed up in Marley, whereas the white birds show up in Paradis, yet both are united in the wings of freedom? Feel free to chime in on this one, unless it's spoilers of course, anime only please. But yeah, very curious indeed. And because I'm already overanalyzing, I also think that there's an argument to be made that the entire narrative in the opening is in many ways echoing the first season as a whole. The opening begins with that marching music, which I think speaks to the first act of war that we saw with the Colossal. The music then takes a darker turn, with the lyrics speaking of how the enemy is cruel but that they'll prevail, which I think describes the events of Trost and how the walls were breached again. But just as suddenly, there's another turn in the opening which brings back those themes of triumph which I think speaks to Aaron's use of the Titan and how that ultimately saved Trost. I think the whole narrative nature in the openings is one that is actually present all throughout the series. Just like with the posters going from Aaron looking up at the destruction of the Titans to him being the destructor, the openings too convey the entire story of the series, with the final openings losing almost all of that initial national pride and patriotic nature and turning into very bleak depictions of war. And in a broader sense, I also think that the use of German throughout the series is another very neat touch that you don't really see in anime much. I do admit this might just be a case of me being from the EU, so it's just a lot more familiar to me than Japanese, but I think by occasionally mixing in an entirely new language, it just adds another layer of contrast and complexity to everything we're seeing. As for the title of the episode, can't look into his eyes yet. I think there are a couple ways of looking at this. First off, eye contact or eyes in general are often used to convey trust or deceit. 
So in the context of this episode, I think you can read it as the wider humanity not being able to trust Aaron just yet. And so, they cannot look into the eyes of someone they sort of wish to be killed. Conversely, I think you can also tie this together with Mikasa in this episode, as during Aaron's tribunal, she couldn't bring herself to look him in the eyes as she admitted that he had indeed attacked her. I think it's just as simple as her wanting to hide that fact and because she still fears for Aaron's life, looking into his eyes as she delivers the report which may doom him is just too painful. Moving into the episode itself, however, we see just how differently the people of the walls are perceiving the unfolding events. When we look at Wall Cena, the wealthiest people of the walls, we essentially just hear disdain about the situation. We hear them talking about how their supplies now might be taken and that their lavish lifestyle might be upset. But when we cut to Wall Rose, we see a much different picture. First off, instead of everyone reading out their newspapers like we see in Wall Cena, the people in Wall Rose all stand together reading out a single paper. This both speaks to the financial standing of these two groups, as one is clearly able to afford much, much more, as well as the isolation their higher financial status brings. Later in the episode, we see how the merchants strongly oppose many of the plans proposed by the scouts, whereas when we see the commoners, they all cheer how Aaron's Titan might be their savior, all standing unified shoulder to shoulder and embracing hope. Class representation and the politics that brings will continue to be an important part of Attack on Titan, so we'll touch on this a whole bunch more as we get later on as well. But as of right now, it's just painting them as two drastically different sides, which of course sets up the drama to follow in Aaron's Tribunal. We then cut to the shot of Scales and this angelic fighter figure. Scales and Lady Justice are of course a near-universal depiction of the rule of law and the justice system in general. So in that sense, it's not much more than just subtly framing the rest of the episode to follow, as again, it would be all about Aaron's judgments. However, because this is overanalyzing, I also think you could talk about how the balance of power is now tipping and what that would mean for the rest of the series. As we've been talking about for the past couple of episodes, the appearance of Aaron's Titan and then the Battle of Trost clearly convey how the tide of battle is turning in favor of parody. Or in other words, leveling out the Titan advantage that Marley had up until now. And so, with Aaron being cleared in this episode, we'll see what a more even battle looks like. And you know, if I were to overanalyze even more, we have another very important lady in the series that has already massively tipped the balance of power. Huh. Like you know, someone like Ymir. And you know, clearing Aaron also means that, while they're obviously unaware of it, they also now possess the Founder's power and by extension, set up everything to follow including the rumbling. So you know, maybe you could look past the obvious representation of Lady Justice and actually see this as a mirror. Okay, yeah, that is very much overanalyzing and frankly makes very little sense. Cutting to some of the military police, we see the same sentiment repeated. Many of them just want to get rid of Aaron, and in their eyes, there really is no two ways about it. In many ways, I think here too you could talk about how the military police, which like we saw with Jean, just live out their days in the inner wall, are sort of conditioned to prefer the safer and more close to home bets. While the scouts try to look at the bigger picture of things and think about how recapturing lost territories might benefit everyone in the long run. In my mind, I think this is just evoking the endless debates people have about domestic versus international matters and how best to allocate resources between these two very important groups. We'll touch on this in a second again, so keep that in mind for now. And a quick note before we move on, I know this is super cringe and I seriously hate doing it, but the last video got incorrectly age-restricted and effectively killed in the algorithm, and even after the restriction was overturned, it just wasn't getting pushed to people. And I know that many of you watching these videos aren't subscribed to the channel, so if you enjoy the series and don't want to miss a future episode because YouTube has deemed you a child in need of protection, do drop a subscription and hopefully that will solve the problem. Alright, thanks a bunch, back to the video. We then cut to Irvin and Pixis walking atop the wall, which again, just like we've talked about in Trust, I think just conveys that the both of them are currently the only ones looking at the bigger picture and how to handle Aaron. Though importantly, we hear that this entire meeting is off the record and that technically, they shouldn't even be meeting. I think this scene is really interesting in how it portrays the two, as Pixis isn't the least bit concerned about formalities or anything like that. 
even casually naming Zackly with no title or anything. Something that catches Irvin off guard as he has to verify whether they're talking about the premier of the three regiments. I think the idea here is just to present them as very similar in that they are both strategists who try to look past the politics, while also showcasing that they are still very, very different in how they go about things. Pixis is quite a bit more eccentric in how he carries himself, while Irvin does very much still play by the book. And that is exactly what we see in the final moments of their meeting, as Pixis asks Irvin whether he believes that there is a chance for them to save Aaron. To which Irvin responds that, no, there really isn't, but that he does have a proposal. Which we of course now know to be the complete Hail Mary they throw during the Tribunal. But I think the best part here is the extreme juxtaposition we see with Pixis, as he casually laughs at Irvin talking about this gamble and just walks off. All while the music is this uneasy pulse. <laughs> So again, even when they're dealing with these sorts of matters, Pixis' eccentricity very much holds. And if you remember the whole Pixis sees things in people that others don't aspect, which we've seen many times in Trost, I think you could also easily say that to Pixis, this is not a gamble at all, and he's certain that Irvin will pull it off. Which is exactly why he's so nonchalant about this whole thing. We then cut to Mikasa and Armin, who are talking about the supposed trial Aaron's supposed to have. And of course, once again, Armin cuts through all of that and just blatantly says, it is to decide whether Aaron lives or not. I think this is just another scene to demonstrate that Armin is in the least bit disillusioned as to what is going on, and is well aware that despite the recapture of Trost with the help of Aaron's Titan, many, many people will still be terrified of the idea that they are now potentially using a Titan as a weapon. And they are then called to deliver the testimonies, and that is where we leave them for now. We then cut to Aaron, who is still chained up in the dungeon and just asking for water or just to go to the bathroom. The guards, on the other hand, just tell him to shut up and call him a monster. Something that Aaron doesn't even disagree with and questioning who he even is himself. And just like with the events of Trost, these super long-term parallels here are nuts. In this case, Aaron is locked up and as far as he's aware, he is truly trapped. On top of that, he is also unsure of himself and is questioning his own sanity. But then, we cut to the next time he's locked up, where he makes it explicitly clear that the only reason why he's here is because he wants to be. Just like we see in Season 1, Paradis is afraid of the potential weapon that Aaron is. Only this time, we are of course talking about the rumbling. But unlike the first time where they could try to contain him, here, he is the one making the demands making it clear that with the Warhammer, he could be out of here and no one could ever stop him. Also, in this episode, we see Aaron wondering about how everyone else is doing and what happened to them. A far cry from what we'd see in the final season, as Aaron would be purposefully trying to get away from everyone and distancing himself from even his closest friends. Though, a quick side note about the flashback, one detail that I loved here is that Aaron's memories contain Marco, someone we of course know to be dead. I think this is just one of those small things that many people might have overlooked, because in the continuity, Marco is dead, so for an animator working on this scene, they simply might not have included him. But in-universe, Aaron is still unaware of his death, and so he appears in his memories just like everyone else. Not sure if it is purposeful or just a happy little accident, but I like the attention to detail. Though returning to the overanalyzing, we see Aaron fearing that he'll be locked up forever, which is of course his one fundamental fear, that being a lack of freedom. Again, in the final season, we see the complete opposite to, so of that, where even while in this cage, he's just talking about fighting and, like I just mentioned, makes it clear that he's not a prisoner so much as he's doing them a favor by just staying quiet. And to finish off those many, many parallels, Hanji then pops in, where in this episode, she locks him up even more before they head off. While in the final season, she can't help but just be fascinated by what Aaron means when he says, fight, fight. Because I don't want to go off on a three hour tangent, we'll leave that for when we get to the final season. But point is, the parallels between the first and final season are plentiful here, and there are still probably countless more that I've just missed. While Aaron's being escorted though, we are introduced to this dude named Mikkei, who apparently sniffs everyone he meets. Now, 
I'ma be honest with you, to me, this is one of those odd things from early Attack on Titan that really sticks out. Because judging by how cold and down to earth the series would be later on, he does feel like a bit of a Jojo character that was written in because hey, Shonen always has to have some quirky characters, right? I think there is a long debate you could have about how even characters like Hanji were much more tuned down as we get later on, and how all of it might have potentially just been Isayama having to force these gimmicks in just to get the manga off the ground. But I am neither educated enough to talk about that, nor do I think it is entirely irrelevant for the purposes of this series. His death would ultimately be pretty tragic, and maybe subconsciously, this quirkiness of his also plays into that. But yeah, his introduction always seemed a little bit wacky to me compared to everything else in the series. And before we move on to the tribunal, the mid-cards we get are just about that. The court system of the walls and how the judgement is conducted in these special proceedings. I don't think there's anything too foreshadowy here or anything, as everything it talks about regarding the importance of politics in this horror deal is exactly what we'd see. So with that, let us get into the court hearing itself. For the first part of this whole deal, we follow Aaron, who has literally no idea what's going on. And as we'd see later in this episode, it is also confirmed that Aaron remembers nothing of what happened before he got his Titan under control. And this is something that I actually really enjoyed from a realism point of view. Because Aaron does genuinely believe he is completely harmless to them and only did what he did to protect himself and his friends. So yes, he wouldn't try to put up any grand fight or anything. He believes that all of this is just a misunderstanding that needs to be talked out, and that is all. And on top of that, he just talked to Levi and Irvin, two people who he believes to be in high authority in the military. So I think it's totally understandable that he's just dumbfounded more than anything else here. We then get into the statements, where Niall of the military police says that he should be disposed of immediately, saying that, while he does acknowledge his usefulness and trust, the military police believe they should extract everything they know from him and just write him off as a heroic sacrifice for humanity. And in my mind, it is this very moment where Irvin and Levi realize they've won. This is super important, so hold that thought for a minute. We then see Priest Nick speak up and blabber on about how Aaron's undermining the sanctity of the walls and whatnot. What I love here though is how we cut to Aaron's inner monologue as he says, Five years ago, no one listened to him, but now he seems to have support. Like, you know, I am not saying this is social commentary or anything, but it's almost as if people in times of crisis lose their ability to make rational decisions and turn to random, completely unfounded beliefs that fit their worldview. Okay, jokes that are not really jokes aside, just like we saw in the mid-cards, as much as the priest is just throwing out completely random nonsense, what matters here is that he has political sway, and so they can just write him and his followers off. Though finally, Irvin speaks up, proposing that they use Aaron to retake Walmaria, and that is it. He puts it as bluntly as possible and does not elaborate at all. So first off, he is just a Giga Chad. But number two, I think this is a case of him not revealing his hand too early. Just like you learned in school when doing time constraint presentations, you don't necessarily have to explain everything. Rather, you say something that naturally poses a question, which is when you elaborate on it on your own terms. And I think this is exactly what Irvin is doing here. The more he says right now, the more doubt he might create. So instead, he simply says a blunt promise and only answers direct questions. And right away, we also see Pixis jump in, saying that, yes, Trost's gates are indeed plugged and won't be moving anytime soon. To which Irvin responds by immediately laying out a plan, proving to everyone in the room that, unlike everyone we've heard so far, he's put a lot more thought into this. And as the merchants once again begin yelling out that recapturing Walmari is pointless, because again, remember that they are the wealthiest of society, so this sort of mission would just mean that the resources are now less concentrated in Walsina. Levi steps in to deliver the home run, if you will. Obviously, the Levi archetype is purposely used to do the whole, the quietest person's words usually speak the loudest, which is exactly what we see. He begins by dunking on the merchants, saying that by we, he just means his fellow rich fat friends but then saying that the lack of land is literally killing them, just like we already heard with Pixis. The priest then starts spewing nonsense again, and once again we cut to Armin thinking that their beliefs have slowed any and all progress. So once again, just adding extra layers of complexity to the politics within the walls. 
It's not just rich and poor, strong and weak, military and civilian, but also this church angle which complicates matters even further. And obviously, that would be a huge deal at the end of the season. After everyone's opening statements, Zackley then turns to Aaron, simply asking him if he can serve the military. To which Aaron clearly responds that yes, yes he can. Though hearing this, the military police cut back by saying that Aaron is not to be trusted as he attacked Mikasa. And we also see Mikasa immediately try to hide the scar. We talked about the implications of it last time, and how it becomes this permanent reminder of how Aaron's rage almost killed her. So I always thought that it actually becoming an explicit plot point was really cool from a realism point of view. And that is exactly what we see, as Rico tells Mikasa that covering up Aaron's outburst might prove even more detrimental. Obviously, watching the series, it's easy for us to say that, wait, surely Aaron is extremely valuable and a great asset for humanity and all that. But try to put yourself in such a situation. No matter how potentially useful he might be, his powers are clearly still very, very volatile. Fearing him and understanding the value of him are not mutually exclusive in this case. Which again, I think is just a great showcase of how Attack on Titan set itself apart from the usual genre tropes where Eren's ability would be immediately embraced. Though from Eren's point of view, we once again see him questioning his own actions. Which is when we see Armin confirm that, yes, Eren does indeed have no recollection of what happened. Memory loss in general is understandably a huge no-no for many people, including myself, but I think it's mostly fine in this case as it's not really the main thing moving the story along or even having any major impact on it to be honest. If anything, it's just there for the sake of dramatization as Eren's cluelessness just adds to the overall uneasiness of the situation. Mikasa then says that Eren protected her twice in Titan form, to which the military police respond by saying that emotions are clearly clouding her judgment, referencing what happened way back in the cabin. I've mentioned it a million times, but again, if there's anything that will shake the usually completely stone-cold and emotionally distant Mikasa, it is Eren, so when she's called out here, it's just another reminder that we are now in a much higher league. And these people couldn't care less how powerful she is or what he means to her. To them, Mikasa is just another soldier trying to protect what is potentially a ticking time bomb. And to top it all off, the people then call out Mikasa directly, saying that, for all they know, she too might be a titan. First off, I do think this is some neat foreshadowing toward the female titan. Secondly, the music in the scene is so good, and those guitar riffs in the background remind me of Death Note for some reason. <laughs> but the rest of the track is also just so, so good. But number three, we've talked about the whole Ackerman bloodline and their potential links to Amir and all of that before. So if we do ever find out that they are in fact something like humans possessing the strength of titans or something, this is another one of those scenes that will just seem funny in hindsight. But now that Mikasa has been called out, Eren's emotions finally boil over and he screams at them to stop. Remember that everyone in this room has literally zero clue about how his power works. So obviously, they are very much shook because who knows, maybe if he gets angry, he'll just pop his titan form and annihilate them before anyone could bat an eye. But he then starts saying that none of them have any idea what they're talking about. And that's when we hear another voice of Eren. Now, you are watching overanalyzing Attack on Titan, so you certainly expected this. But on initial viewing, you just take it to be your typical anime MC asking where does his bravery come from, right? But is it really? Because if we listen to the rest of his speech saying, how can you afford not to let those with power fight? Doesn't that just so happen to line up with the final season, Aaron, where he says just that? We have the power of the rumbling, so how can we not use it to ensure our safety? And just like the final season where he goes off on his own, realizing that no one wants to help him, here too, he just blatantly calls everyone a coward. And that steam swirling around him, the focus on his eye, everything here seems awfully sus to me. And I do think there's a case to be made that future Aaron shenanigans are afoot. And this may actually be a case of him protecting Mikasa, because again, she is a monster at combat. So if she is suddenly called out as a conspirator and a titan herself, who knows what might happen, right? Certainly interesting to think about if you ask me. 
But then we get into the most memed and probably best part of this episode as Levi casually walks up to Aaron and just starts beating him. And this is what I mentioned before with Aaron and Levi's observation. This is their trump card. The military police said that they would dissect him, but as Levi begins beating him, they are scared out of their minds, so he asks just that. How do you expect to dissect him if you are afraid he'll transform? I can kill him, but can you? He even goes as far as to build Aaron up, saying that he alone took down 20 titans. But again, he keeps beating him, showcasing that unlike them, he is not the least bit shaken by what might happen here. So effectively, what he does here is bluntly tell them and more importantly show them. No one except me can keep him under control. And he doesn't mention it, but everyone knows that he was fired upon by cannons and not only did he survive, even his friends got away without so much as a scratch, right? And he knows full well that the people here know of his status, they know of his combat abilities. And so, they play exactly that. Titan or no Titan, he is the only one capable of killing Garen, and to further cement that point, he explicitly says that, yeah, it's a shame, but there really is no other alternative. If he does anything fishy, I will kill him, and that is that. But at the same time, we have to remember that, as much as this may just seem cool, remember that this is actually just a gamble. A smart gamble, sure, but keep in mind that neither Irvin nor Levi or even Aaron know how his powers work. He could have actually transformed here and now, so this is exactly that. A all or nothing play by Irvin, which just happened to work out. And that is when Irvin speaks again, detailing the upcoming mission and saying that Levi will be personally responsible for him. And with them more than proving, or at least convincing them that, unlike everyone else in the room, they are capable of containing whatever Aaron throws at them, their plan is accepted. And one last thing to mention with the court scene, I have zero artistic background whatsoever, but I am 99% certain that the painting we see on the ceiling just has to reference some piece of art. The closest I could find is the Battle of Angiari, I guess, a lost painting of Da Vinci, which could also coincide with Aaron losing his memories, but I'm not exactly sure that it is in fact referencing that. If anyone has a better guess, feel free to throw that in the comments. And the last scenes of this episode are just to tell us that all of this was in fact just theatrics. Because remember that on initial viewing, up to this point, we've only seen Irvin and Levi for like all of 10 minutes. So obviously the series doesn't want us to actually think that Levi just beat him up for the funsies. And we also see them all say that they have each other's respect and that everything is groovy. And the very last thing is of course the callback to the tooth Levi knocked out. As Hanji unveils it, saying that she grabbed it for research. And it's then that Aaron's healing ability is very much set in stone as his tooth has already regrown. And just like with the OP, we also get a new ending for the second core. I am extremely biased here because this sort of music is right up my alley, but I absolutely love this one. I love myself some over-the-top guitar riffs so I could listen to this one for hours. In fact, I have. It is on my main Spotify playlist. As for the visuals, this one isn't as foreshadowy as Season 2, but there is still some interesting stuff in this one. The ending starts with what seems to be a female character dropping a walnut. I think the easy interpretation here is that this is either Amir who created them, or the church which would try to hide them, and the walnut itself is the walls. Just like the walnut rolling past them, the rumbling would obviously be a huge part for everyone involved. And just like we'd see at the end of the season, the outer shell would indeed be broken and we'd see the true foundation of the walls. Also, full transparency, I could talk about the walnut for another half an hour and how it symbolizes different things in many different cultures, but I think that is better left for another day. And also, this scene of humanoid figures standing side by side is also likely referencing the titans within the walls. There's also the way the soldiers are standing, with Bertolt being the only of the Marley squad to face the wall that is detailing the history of the Titans. Revealing how, unlike Reiner and Annie who are still dedicated to the goals of Marley, Bertolt wavers without a clear guide, just like we'd see in Season 2. And of course, all the ODM scenes of them running across Aaron's arm and all of that are just pure eye candy. So yeah, nothing super foreshadowy, but in hindsight, the two sides of the war, the whole titans within the walls and all of that, can be drawn from this one pretty easily. 
But with that, that is episode 14. We're back to solo episodes, but there it is. Now that we're into 2023, the final, 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 this time for real final season should wrap up the series. So I hope you're excited for the many, many overanalyzing episodes to follow. Unless they announce a movie, which I've been expecting for like the past two years. Hello, this is Editing Kuroto, and yeah, this was recorded before the announcement, but they did kind of exactly what I've been memeing about for like the last year, and yes, the final, final part will actually be two parts. I guess that does put the movie theory to bed, I think, I really hope so, but hey, at least both of them are coming supposedly in 2023, so there's still that to be excited about. Alright, back to past Kuroto. All that said, next time planning for the expedition beyond the walls is in full swing, so I hope to see you then as we continue overanalyzing Attack on Titan. And that's the video. Yeah, I've gotten myself into a real pickle with these double uploads and it's been super rough, but nothing is stopping the Attack on Titan train. With the One Piece series now nearing completion, I do hope to try to up the pace of these somewhat, so hopefully we'll be trotting toward the end of the season relatively quickly from here on out. No promises yet though, the bonus Last of Us videos are really taking their toll. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my rambling, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye